I get over here and I start dancing and I'm so excited once that music starts. Oh my goodness. It is the time later, much, much later than usual. Apologies, everyone. We've got, uh, we've had some internet technical difficulties. Whew. Coordinating from across the pond can sometimes be very difficult as much as we try. Thank you for joining us here, everyone. We're so happy to see you tonight and or this morning, wherever you may be. This is the This Week in Science podcast broadcast, and we're excited to be gearing up for episode 900 tonight. You you ready, team? So ready. Yeah. Yeah. We ready. We're going to make it go. We're going to start this thing in just a moment and uh, do some sciencing because that's what we do. And we're glad for you to be here. Let's see if it all works. We'll see if um, if if Justin's internet and everything work well and we'll keep going as we're going. But now it's time to start the show, yo. Yeah? Yeah. Justin's not yeah. saying anything. Okay. We no. can't test it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Of course we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let us begin. <laughs> That's so great. In three, two, this is Twists. This Week in Science, episode number 900. Recorded on Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. 900 weeks of science. 9999, number nine. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with base, fertilizer, and the alphabet, and the number nine. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Global warming is coming. Despite what you have read, despite everything you have heard, despite everything you know to be true, regardless of your better judgment and your amygdala's common sense application of fight or flight, do not panic. Seem to be increasing. The responses to those threats underwhelming. The proposals by world governments undeliverable. The urgency in public conversation absent and the predicted outcomes prophetically grimmer by the day. But whatever you do, do not panic. Sure, the moment to stop it completely is past. Sure, there's a level of sea level rise, now unavoidable. And sure, the short-sightedness of past inactions has decidedly put us up a creek and downwind of a pig farm, all without a paddle. But do not panic. Because where there are problems, there are solutions. And we will absolutely can and will science our way out of this. As long as you maybe just panic a little bit, then slap yourself in the face a few times, pour cold water over your head because for some reason, then say, I got this, roll up your sleeves, and listen to the 900th episode of Lucian Science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. And it's not just another episode, not just another episode. It is our 900th episode. This is 900. Wait a second. Wait a second. 900 episodes of a weekly show. That means we've been doing this for a while. 900 weeks, give or take, a little bit oh more, gosh. which is, you know, over 17 years of <sighs> science in podcast form. 
our podcast is old enough to drive. <laughs> oh. Almost old enough to vote. Almost old enough to vote and go to war for the country. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we look at it really going back, then uh, we can go back. We can go back. And it's probably old enough to drink, which I'm doing yeah. right now, raising a glass to you all who are here joining us tonight, to my wonderful co-hosts, Blair and Justin, for being a part of the show. Thank you. Thank you. Because honestly... You, our audience, my co-host, but really my the, the audience here, our community, without you, there would be no reason to record. There would no, be no reason to be live. And so this is for you. We can't there do this without you. There are reasons for being live. Yeah, I mean, we still, might, we still might have a phone call and talk about science and, you know, debate and, and have some fun, but... Uh, not this early. <laughs> no. <laughs> At four in the morning. I, I don't know. Do as much research. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us, and we're glad that you are here. Whether this is your first episode with us or your nine hundredth, we are just happy that you're here with us, and we hope that you enjoy the show. All right. So what do we have on the show for us tonight? We have so many wonderful stories. As usual, it's going to be a great show. I have stories that are hopefully optimistic. And, you know, we're going to talk about fertilizer because fertilizer is important. We're going to talk a little bit about the cosmic spin cycle and how we're taking a look at that. I've got some vaccine news because, yeah, you know, COVID, it's not really over. It's not over. What? And, yeah. And then at the end of the show, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you all to get get some sleep. So I'm just telling you now what I'm going to tell you later, oh. which is at the end of the show, I'm going to say, go to bed. And then we're all going to go to bed. Oh. Even you, Justin, even though you just got up. But anyway, uh, Justin, what did you bring for the show? Uh, so I'm going to counter some of that optimism with a Greenland ice cap update. Spoiler alert. It's not good news. Uh I got some. I got some other stuff though too. I've got uh, a really good. I haven't heard much about Utsi in a while. It was new, and some Utsi. ancient words of them, maybe. Justin, could you please tell us those things again? Oh, good grief! Is it really going to be like this? <laughs> is it that, is it that bad? Because it's so strange. On this end, I can't see it. You two come through crystal clear and no hickety ups, but apparently That's I got better. all sorts. Nope. So I got a Greenland ice update. Spoiler alert, not good news. Good news in plant research. Utsi, the Iceman update, and some maybe. And something maybe got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this might just edit me out of the show now, and I'll just, well, I'll just my part of the show. I'll send it. Turn, in, maybe like, turn off your video. Set. Turn off your video. Yeah, turn off your video. It doesn't. It doesn't help. We fight this. It's it doesn't point. do anything to the audio quality. It's the same, it's bouncing signals uh, around the planet on, on low-grade internet. Low-grade internet. Okay, I'm, when you start, okay, I'm going to click a button in your mic settings now and see if this helps. I don't know if it will or if it won't. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Don't touch anything. Now, please. Do it. I won't. Go ahead and talk. Okay, I will I'll, I'll continue to say that unfortunately, for some reason, there seems to be a high demand for internet at 5.30 in the morning Central European time in Copenhagen that disappears later on in the day. But your wife, you're, you're perfect right issue. now. Your audio is perfect. Okay, oh. please tell us again what okay. you have brought for the show, Justin. No, why'd you turn your video okay. on? Okay. Well, it's just because now it's fixed. Everything's uh, working okay. out. Okay, go ahead. So I've got a a Greenland ice. Oh, I've got bad news about <laughs> Greenland, people. I got good news about plants. 
Oh, it's uh, Otsu the Iceman, who uh, used to listen to the show uh, 5,300 years ago. Uh, update, he's got an update. And then some ancient words of wisdom, maybe, uh, inscribed upon a comb. An ancient Canaanite. Uh. Okay, now do that again. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> That was perfect. <laughs> okay. Disclaimer, okay. Disclaimer, disclaimer. The we'll use the episode. comb. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Rachel the comb to the comb, comb through this episode. Yes. Yeah. For comb. all of the blips and blurbles. <laughs> Blair. Oh, Blair, hey, Blair. Oh, I, okay. Forgot. I forgot okay. I was doing science. I got yeah, so wrapped here. up in this right here. Yes. So um I have pigs, I have looky loo fishes, and a late breaking story about octopuses um and i also wanted to uh, drop that base as kiki previously discussed it's all about that base about that base no it problem. is but it's not it's not it's all about us right now because we're doing this show here and we are so excited that you're here with us like i said already but if at any point you realize oh my gosh i'm not subscribed to twist you can find us all places podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. You can also find us places like YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch because that's where we live stream every week, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, unless, of course, Justin's internet is being a problem like <laughs> it was tonight. And we are also Twist Science on Twitter and Instagram. And you can just find us at twist.org if all of this is too much information for your brain. Just remember that one thing. That one thing. That's what's important. But right now, it's time to jump into the science. I'm going to start the show off with something that's coming up that is it's, it, wherever you are. Justin's already at November 10th. We are just about at the cusp of November 10th here. November 10th celebrated every year is the World Science Day for Peace and Development. And it's meant from UNESCO's International Days to highlight the important role of science in society. And I thought, what better opportunity for us at Twist to just kind of wax poetic about our 900th episode for just a moment about the importance and relevance of science in our daily lives. So, um, this year's Science Day for Peace and Development is aimed at uh, sustainable basic sciences. Uh, 2022 actually is the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. Hmm. And you can use hashtag Science Day all over social media to be a part of World Science Day conversations around the globe. Um, and so this year is focused more so on basic science, uh, which means that research, which has been done for years and years and years, not necessarily knowing that it's going to have a payoff, hmm. right? It's the stuff that is the basis for things that we take for granted today. Polymerase chain reaction. Yes, while we might all kind of look askance at the Nobel Prize winner who came up with PCR uh, these days for some of his more uh, interesting uh, ideas on, on science and health. He did come up, Kerry Mollis, Dr. Kerry Mollis came up with an amazing reaction, which is used today in laboratories around the world. We used it during the COVID-19 pandemic to help, and it is still used to test and find viral fragments that, ident that are identified from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So basic science led to PCR, led to our ability to be able to use this in some of our health, public health initiatives today. We also have developments in nuclear science. We have developments in material sciences, chemistry, biology, all of the things. Blair, is science ever not a part of your life? No, <laughs> I'm always thinking about it. It's <laughs> probably annoying to people around me, but it's that's I mean, that's the beauty, right? Is is science fundamentally is about figuring out how the world works and how how th how things respond when you manipulate them. Right. It's all about the manipulation of variables and cause and effect. And 
it impa- it impacts everything everything that we do and it, it has uh the more informed you are about the way the world works then the the better the world can be i think even with basic things just like when we report on stories about how societies respond to one another and the intric- intricacies that that exist there that can help inform us and help us be better yeah it's yep. you know you've, you've there's there's really never been a a downside to scientific knowledge that i can think of <laughs> you know maybe maybe the atom bomb but i feel like there were things related to that that were also important to the betterment of society so it's right. you know it's it's really you got to tease away at that at that that ball of christmas lights you know <laughs> <laughs> that is our existence Justin, how has science uh, been a part of your life? Well, you know, I think that the highest and best achievement of science thus far uh, is still the dishwasher. <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> you think of the number of marriages, relationships in general that the dishwasher has saved. Uh, you know, talk about bettering human existence on the planet. That's that's got to be at the top of it. And then there's certainly like, in the, you know, in the long list of diseases that science has overcome. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, yeah, I don't get leeches when I go to the doctor. To, to you know, just I mean, you could because they do still do use them. <laughs> Antibiotics, Antibiotics alone is used. Yeah. The, the, the things, everything to do with agriculture. Yes. You know, if we mm-hmm. were basing uh, the current human population today on agriculture from just a hundred years ago there would be mass starvation and famine yeah the advances yeah you, know, you take a simple thing a simple thing freezing food mm-hmm. the ability to freeze or to have refrigerators in your home but also to refrigerate food when it is in transport the whole entire system of transporting food around the world like all of these things uh, that didn't exist, that now do exist, absolutely have have positive impact. You know, germ theory, like learning how to get <laughs> well, sick from know. things and how, mm-hmm. how sickness spread, pretty important. Pretty gosh darn important. And one of the, it, it, in terms of recent outcomes of scientific uh, efforts, so uh, respiratory diseases had been thought to be spread by fomites, which are the spittle basically that lands on stuff Um, and then you get on your hands and you wipe your nose. And so Mm -hmm. that does happen in part, but people had completely underestimated the influence of viral aerosols of these viral particles that remain suspended in the air for hours, days after people are in a room. And it was the COVID-19 pandemic that really pushed advancement forward in this area prior to the pandemic the World Health Organization did not accept viral aerosols as a method of transmission. It now does for respiratory diseases. So this is progress. This is progress. And so as much as we had to hurt, <laughs> mm-hmm. science helps bring us along. It, it it advances so many aspects of our lives. And one aspect of UNESCO's World Science Day is a reiteration of the importance of science to everybody's lives and to the future of humanity and the universal human right. It is listed as a universal human right, access to science. That means access to scientific information, access to scientific innovations, access to scientific careers. Science is for everyone and it is accepted as a universal human right. And so, I don't know, I'm just thinking about this day as it comes forward. Um, You know, I'm just, and our 900th episode, I'm just very, very proud to be part of and have been part of sharing science with people, even science they don't sometimes like to hear. So anyway, let's move on from this Fomentation? What am I thinking? I'm not fomenting anything. No, Justin, what's happening? Something bad, right? This is not just good news, is it? 
Uh, no, this is just bad news. Uh, right. the <laughs> science news segment that's not afraid to tell you what's really happening in the world today. Well. <laughs> Researchers from Dartmouth, UC Irvine, and DTU in Denmark have made a horrifying discovery. And mm -hmm. they published this in the journal Nature. The loss of ice from Greenland's largest frozen basin is occurring much faster than expected and could contribute up to six times more to the global sea level rise by the year 2100 than climate models are currently projecting. That would be somewhere in the neighborhood of half an inch or more of water to sea levels by the end of this century. So, uh, I've been to the northern, north, northernmost, northwestern town in Greenland. Lovely place. Northeastern Greenland, where this research took place, not so lovely. It's a really <laughs> difficult environment to monitor uh, ice melt or anything else. Researchers used satellite data and numerical modeling with GPS data collected from the harsh interior of Greenland over the past decade. They found four extensive speed up and thinnings triggered, uh, or they, excuse me, they found extensive speed up and thinning triggered by a dramatic warm ocean current event that took place in 2012, which has mm. since propagated some 200 to 300 kilometers inland along the Northeast Greenland ice stream. So for those not familiar with kilometers, 200 to 300 kilometers is about approximately equivalent to 200 to 300,000 meters. So that's, that's a lot of meters inland. Despite being an exceptionally cold place and having exceptionally cold 2020, 2021 years, Northeastern Greenland is an Arctic desert where per precipitation is as low as 25 millimeters or about an inch per year in places. So the ice sheet, as it is bloating, as it's melting, as this, this cascade effect of collapse is taking place, is not regenerating. Mm. It does not have any sort of an offset of additional ice and snow falling. Okay. Precipitation. So this is according to uh, Shafkat Abbas Khan, professor at DTU. We can see that the entire basin is thinning and the surface speed is accelerating. Every year, the glaciers we've studied have retreated farther inland, and we predict that this will continue over the coming decades and centuries. Under present-day climate, it is difficult to conceive how this retreat could stop. Our data, shows, uh, our data shows us that what we see happening at the front reaches far back into the heart of the ice sheet. Uh, Co-author Eric Renault, professor of Earth Systems and uh, uh, Science at UC Irvine, said that the more precise observations of the change in ice velocity are included in models, estimates of global sea level rise projected by the UN's the IPCC's uh, estimations need to be corrected upwards, which, regardless of what glacier, or Antarctic, or, or where you're looking, that seems to be what everyone has told us. What all the models have told us is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change really needs to get corrected upwards. And Renaud uh, will finish this he says, by saying, he says, uh, we foresee profound changes in global sea levels, more than currently projected by existing models. Yeah, so all of those models that we uh, go to online that are like, imagine where you live 50 years from now with global climate change and sea level rise. They're wrong. You would be much more underwater. <laughs> um, but this is part, again, this is, this is part of the process and this is while it's unfortunate this is part of the scientific process of putting greater resolution into the data so that we understand what we're up against mm -hmm. better so it yeah, sounds you have to, you, you're trying to prevent 
more carbon dioxide or you're trying to prevent more climate change. You're trying to curb what's happening. But we are at the point now where things are yeah. going to happen. There's no stopping the happening, no matter how good a job we do. And so the second part of it is preparing for that. And yes. so, uh, yes, there is. You, it's unfortunately a really difficult balance of trying to not create just the worst panic where people are just like, <laughs> just do paralyzed do? you don't want that yeah. but you definitely want your realistic model so that you can save lives that's the other piece that i feel like keeps getting missed here is this feels to many people on the planet very far away this particular mm -hmm. area that is losing ice but it impacts the whole world yeah i don't yeah. know there's a tropical storm uh it's about to hit florida no oh, and it's take November. out the sls it's November. It's still hurricane season. Yeah. No. It is, technically. No, it isn't. Yes. No, I don't think so. I think it's yeah. past. Yeah, no, I, think it's, I don't think I this has know. happened in the last Se 50, season? Once in 50 years. What is that? Justin, season? <laughs> Quote, unquote. What word Gary, are you saying? Uh, Gary in the chat room says, unfortunately, too many people are just counting on science to save us from global warming. I would say that, unfortunately, too many people aren't counting on science to save us and aren't investing in it. Like, it, there's, there's a lot of, of talk about potential solutions. Yeah. There's not the funding that the one source for those solutions is ultimately going to come from, which is science. It's the only thing yeah. that will save us from ourselves again, again, again. Well, and the problem is you can't just throw money at carbon capture and call, call it a day, which is kind of why I, I was I brought up what I did before is like you you can't just focus on, oh, well, if we if we pay enough money to plant more trees, it'll all just go away. <laughs> like, no, well, no, well, no, that's so, right. That's over. On. We're past Wait, that Justin, point. Justin reported on the we can't plant enough trees yeah. to well, actually yeah, make up on. for it. I did report on that, but I'm going to take it back. We could. <laughs> We look plant all the could. trees. It's I did the math. It's it's in the neighborhood of two trillion trees. You know, let's put two dollars a tree at it, you know, money wise. So somebody says, you tell me if you give me four trillion dollars tomorrow or the day after. It's fine. I can wait. See you on Mars. Got it. I will. <laughs> I, I can. I can. Th then you have engineers engineers who will, right, who will figure out how to design a massive yeah. growing and planting apparatus uh, we'll have greenhouses popping up all over the planet we'll have every plant botanist plant biologist plant breeder plant geneticist Man. designing the right trees we'll have every if microbiologist only, if, if making only. sure the soil is the proper right, soil right. to encourage that and yeah, in if only 50 years <laughs> That's the problem, though. Who's going to die in those fifty years, Justin? If and if They're who's going to die in the who next wasn't year? Gonna but die if in those only 50 years. trees yeah, weren't made just... of weed, right? I mean, that would be the, then everybody would be into it. They'd be all wanting to make money. We'd actually that grows faster. Yeah, smoke it if you got it. Anyway, I mean, that might even be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone might have stumbled upon an even better idea than trees. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But in 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 the big picture of where we are, we can't just focus on science alone. We can't just focus on corporations alone. We can't just focus on individuals. It's your fault. You need to change your personal habits. Unplug your no. computer. <laughs> no. We need to be active and we need to be pressuring our politicians. We need to be pushing for regulations. We need to be pushing for subsidies because without the money, I mean, yes, investors, if you've got the money to invest, you divest from the bad things, reinvest in the good things, and then we'll see things happen. So if you want to see a good world coming, you have to put your money where? Your desires are and we have to put to your and our votes yes. that is yes. it and we just passed election day in the united states and i am pleased to say that it didn't go as badly as <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking it might but you know yeah it would be nice if there was control of, of you know both <sighs> uh, kind of different spots of congress that could actually work on this but yeah you know but what this is right but now, this is where, this is where science and 
politics and people really yeah. do overlap is our future. And yeah, yeah. It, you wanted it, to say something, Justin. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to say, while I disagree with the effectiveness of the, the, the messaging of throwing soup at uh, masterpieces of art. Yeah. I love it. I absolutely love what they were saying. Here's a hundred and short year old painting that we, we value so highly that we conserve it, even protect it with glass. The painting wasn't hurt. When we display yeah. it and say, this belongs in a museum so the public can experience this because we have conserved and cherished this, this important thing uh, uh, throughout time. Yeah. The point of compare that to a future that we aren't conserving. We yep. compare this, like the, the, the actual concept, I think was really powerful and really a strong statement. We will do so much to conserve the past. Why would we not do so for the future? I don't think the messaging was lost. People were like, hey, they threw soup on a painting. That's terrible. Because it was oil-based paint. That's what I read. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's also, no, it's also this just glass. The, that... There's a plexiglass thing in front of the painting, so the painting wasn't hurt. The frame was, but that's a part of the story. But the other thing is, I love the target. Because of all of the artists you could have chosen, maybe you could have gotten away with a Warhol or Jackson Pollock a little bit, maybe, depending. But Van Gogh. <laughs> Van Gogh was an artist who was not afraid of a public spectacle. Or of soup. Self-harm, uh, self, uh, self even. Mutilate, yeah, yeah. Yeah, self-harm. Yeah. That, that, that showed his passion for a, a, a subject. And so yeah. of all of the artists you could have chosen, that was the right one. In fact, if he had been here, I think he, he would have, have not applied. only destroyed the painting, but maybe he lost another ear. <laughs> well, we will never know that but particular in thing. A, in terms but of in, messaging to the public, yeah. I don't know who gets reached by that message and who really follows it. And, really and who really got the message as it Nobody. was intended. Because the yeah. news you got like, it. oh, they threw soup on it. <sighs> but now that you've explained it, people who hadn't heard of it, maybe in our audience, now they understand it better. Hmm. So... I hope this helps everybody's water cooler conversation a little bit more. I mean, especially now that we're all, are we all going to Mastodon? I don't know. I can't even talk about social media and Mastodon because that's like, it makes Mastodon, mastitis, it's boobies. I don't know what's going on. Blair, what tell us about our ears. Talking about? I'm so confused. <laughs> we're going we're to write a, 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 a extinct species. Yeah. I'm confused. Anyway, is that wait? Hang on a Yay. second. Hang on. Is that a new social media thing that people are supposed to go to to leave Twitter, and then you're going to all the academics went. The academic, the academics, their, not the just academics. Their hashtag rooms, but you're also everybody's going to be siloed completely I, in I different know. social yeah. media. Just oh, it'll wow. blow over. Just let it. Okay. Anyway, just let it go. Stay on Twitter. It's fine. We're still there. But and Blair, pay attention to don't. Take your eye off the target. Doof, pay attention doof, to climate doof, change. Doof, Don't pay attention doof, to the doof, blue check mark. Anyway. Doof, 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 Are we going to the club after doof, this or what? Doof, doof. It's our 900th episode. I think we got a party afterwards. Boom. Even boom, though we're boom, in boom. three Anywhere that there's bass. Bass, bass, anyway, bass. Uh, when you go to the club, the club, as I call it. Um, and <laughs> Do you, you know. Do you know. We call it the club. club. Anyway. Going clubbing. When you're really, <laughs> this is the thing, you know, you've actually used really this in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> when you're really, you know, you're really, you're vibing, man, in the club. Anyway, you're when you really feel it, you're really dancing it out. Um, so I just wanted to know why? <laughs> what about that music really, really gotcha? Um, and it is that bass. But it's more complicated than that. Um, some researchers recruited participants attending a live lab concert for electronic music duo Orfsks. <laughs> and the concert... What? And the concert goers were equipped with motion sensing headbands to monitor their dance moves. <laughs> they weren't just checking how good they, they were at dancing. Actually, they were checking how, how hard... They were dancing. How how hard they were enjoying that bass. Anyway, 
They were also asked to fill out survey forms before and after the event. And that was made to uh, to make sure that they the sound that they were changing underneath the music was undetectable to human ears. They also measured concert enjoyment and they examined how the music felt physically all through the survey. But then the headbands were really what, were looking at their their heart rate. And, and what so did what the, they were what did the club nerds <laughs> report? Yes, so they so what they were doing, I didn't even get to the actual variable they were manipulating here yet. There was a 45 minute concert by Orfsk. And the researchers manipulated the very low bass playing speakers. They turned them on and off every two minutes. So it wasn't the individual song. It was a regular interval. And they found that the amount of movement was 12% greater when these speakers were on that were introducing levels of bass that were too low to hear. So this super low bass sound was causing people to dance more intensely. They were clerping. They were clerping <laughs> harder. <laughs> Clerp extreme, you know. Um, anyway, they they speculate that these physical processes, uh, the 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 low undetectable bass, was creating a neurological connection between music and movement, just based on this undetectable bass sound that was undetectable to our ears, but obviously detectable to our brains, and the the. And the neurological connection was picking up on low frequencies and could affect the perception of groove. <laughs> so, I you love know, that groove is now a scientific term. Yeah. It's like, how much yeah. did the music make you want to move? Well, that's right. the groove. That's man. the groove, baby. So, oh, <laughs> so this, this is absolutely the technology that needs to get deployed in offices around the country just to, just come in and just start putting on your subhuman hearing range bass and just and just watch and see if any of your coworkers start just like Ooh. oh guaranteed i'd start dancing in my seat i dance during the day all the time <laughs> in my in my office anyway can i tell um, a story but... about marshall right now yes please yes so apparently uh when marshall and i first started dating um he would go into work and we would go to the club over the weekend in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. he'd go into, into work on Monday and uh, he'd go in and put a, his headphones on. And apparently he would sit at his desk listening to dance music, house music, trance sure. music, all the things. And one day his office mate threw down her mouse and her pens and she said, what you say? Stop it! And he took his headphones off and he said, What? Stop what? That, that doof, 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 doof. You're saying it continually. (laughs) (laughs) So apparently he was working at his computer listening to music with his headphones in and just going, Doof, 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 doof. doof, doof, doof. Oh, hilarious. (laughs) Absolutely oh, ruining his co-worker's day. But anyway, we digress. They, they didn't even need these speakers. They just needed to bring Marshall into the club. It's true. Doof, 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 doof. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, there you go. So there's different people have different vestibular sensitivity to this base. And so they uh, next they want to look at the brain mechanisms involved to figure out how the low frequencies impact vestibular, tactile, and auditory pathways. But I just think it's hilarious that musicians could be adding low-level bass to their music that is imperceptible to the human ear, but could impact our desire to dance. And is that cheating (laughs) is my question. Right? Suddenly the DJs... If I'm having fun. It's not a good DJ. It's just good, very low frequencies. Um, yeah, and as David Ha is saying in our YouTube chat, 
uh, infrasound can have physiological effects. Yes. And so we know that there are um, different frequencies of sound that are outside the range of human hearing. And uh, they actually, yes, can have physiological effects. If you have higher frequency sounds, those are the ones that are being used by the military and the police as uh, crowd deterrents. They can be highly tuned and are, uh, create a lot of uh, feelings of pain. However, yeah. these very low frequency sounds apparently have different impacts. Mm -hmm. anyway, this make, feels, they, this, they make you want to move in a different way. This, this <clears throat> legitimately feels like magic to me. But you could imperceptibly impact people's desire to dance. This sounds like a magic spell. <laughs> I will put you under my control now. Yeah. At it's the like bar magic. It's very good. Blair, you and the clubbing. I'm never going to get that out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you tell? I go to the club all the time. You go to the club. I go all the time. Oh. I love the bass. <laughs> Um, and this band, I had uh, taken a moment to give a listen to the band Orphix, O-R-P-H-X. And this band is a uh, very uh, industrial, experimental noise. Um, <laughs> so I depend. I mean, if you were there for a house music concert and you ended up in the industrial concert, then um, maybe the very low frequency sounds did help people dance. Um, if you're into into industrial stuff, give Orphix a listen. They were involved in science. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where pretty this cool. was, but and, like, and it was been, Canada, been, I think. Yeah, it was at McMaster University, Canada, mm -hmm. um, which if is in Canada. Been, Go ahead. If you've been clubbing long enough, <laughs> oh, Orphix is Canadian too. You may have lost a significant portion of your hearing. If but you can still feel it. But you can still feel it. But you can still feel it if it's got that that that. Uh, it's all about that base. About that base. Base. No yeah. trouble. Well, because I mean, Dan <laughs> Daniel Cameron, the the first author on this paper, is a drummer. Oh, so he's I was wondering about that too, because yeah. like. First of all, definitely has hearing loss if you're yeah. a drummer. For sure. I've I've never <laughs> met uh, I've never met a drummer the... who you didn't have to uh, talk uh, talk loud to, and have yeah. them staring at your lips while you talked, uh -huh. for them to get it wrong. Like it's it's really bad. Like if you're gonna play drums, kids to the kids out there, if you're gonna play drums and you want to do that, that's great. You've got to wear the earplugs. You have to. You I mean, that's those... true for brass. I, I have my hearings. Ruined. And if you're going to the clubs, <laughs> it's Friday night. I'm going to the clubs. I'm going to put my earplugs in my ears to protect yes. my hearing for my yes. future self because I love my hearing and I want to get old and still yes. be able to hear. Yeah. OK, that's not yes, good baby. rapping. And, you know, I don't want that. To oh, yeah. I about... didn't even know it was. I thought you were yeah. just saying No, I, I very I much wanna... wish I could go to 15-year-old yeah. me and just shove, like, <laughs> earplugs into my hands. Shake her. Shake her. Yeah, you put them in the wrong place. That would have been also my, part of the problem. My tinnitus is just so crazy these days. But, geez, what would happen if instead of giving everyone earplugs, uh, it were a field of plants and we just sprayed it with fertilizer? That was, uh, I don't know. The plants would dance. <laughs> it's the plant club. The fertilizer. Oh. Yeah, putting We're... a fertilizer in the flurb, as some people call it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Can you tell me about the fertilizer? Okay, I got to tell you about the fertilizer now. So, researchers were like, hey, all these people in agriculture are taking fertilizers and pesticides and they're just spraying them all over fields and you know pesticides they don't want the little insects to come around but you know there are pollinators and others who are attracted to these plants potentially especially if they flower and uh, so the researchers uh, based on earlier evidence, they know that bees can detect electric fields of flowers and are uh, attracted to the ion field, basically this electric charge, the electric field that is found around flowers. And so these researchers publishing in the journal PNAS 
flowers. They specifically, uh, PNAS Nexus, not flowers, they specifically uh, sprayed fertilizer on flowers. They created artificial flowers with charges. They tested the impact of adjusting the electrical field of these plants uh, to the insect behavior. And they found that bees are less attracted to flowers after they have been sprayed with fertilizer. And the reasoning that they've come to understand is that the, uh, the fertilizer triggers a physiological response in the plant. The plant then sends molecules to different places within itself, which leads to a change in the ions that are get, being released in the uh, and the balance of ions at different places. This changes the electric field, and bees don't like it, and so they don't go to the flowers for a period of time afterwards. Things like rain. They also they also wanted to check and see because they know rainstorms can also impact uh, fields, and they they found that rain also does impact the ion fields, but uh, don't impact rain doesn't impact the behavior of the bees as much as the chemical sprays that we're putting onto our agricultural products. So, man, that's that's one of those times you think you're helping the plant and you're actually hurting it. Right. Yeah. Especially with fertilizer, you know, with pesticide, it's very selfish. You know, it's like, oh, we want the plant to grow more and not be eaten by insects. And so you'd think, okay, having insects not coming to the plants is fine, but with fertilizer, right. And so it's just an, another, just a, I think the, the interesting aspect of it also is this is something that we hadn't thought about before. This interaction of the bees with the electrical properties of the plants that they're interacting with. How many other things are we interacting, are we affecting the way that um, that insects, pollinators, birds, other animals that have different sensory systems that they rely on uh, interact with things that are important to us. And I was thinking about your, your bee study from last week, Blair. Mm -hmm. Oh, the And the balls. Bees. Yeah. The playing bees. What if those balls just had an electric charge. Oh. That was something that they are naturally stim uh, stimulated by or interested in. That is fascinating. That's a really interesting idea. Mm hmm. That's. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You gotta, this is one of those things where now you gotta go back in time. You gotta redo <laughs> every <laughs> bee study you've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> this is like when we found out about how mice don't like it when it's cold in a lab and you're like well you gotta redo every single mouse study you've ever done you ever. gotta turn up the heat and start over this is the same you have to yeah. look at the the electromagnetic field you, you're doing you gotta do electromagnetic chess here with the with the bees <laughs> and look at that for everything that could be how they're doing everything right yeah. So anyway, electric fields, bees, flowers, pollinating, who knew, and our fertilizers, and uh, they, they affect the way that the insects interact for a short period of time. What you got, Justin? I got some, uh, <clears throat> some more plant study news. Scientists, this is good news. I've got good news. Scientists <gasps> from Nanyang Technological University. Singapore have genetically modified a plant protein that is responsible for oil accumulation in plant seeds and edible nuts. They got lab-friendly Arabidopsis plant seeds to accumulate 15 to 18 percent more oil when it was grown with the modified protein under laboratory conditions. Most oil-producing crops, things like palm, soybean, sunflower, rapeseed, peanut, that sort of thing, already have such a high percentage of oil in their fruit or seeds that it is hard to increase their oil content through traditional crop crossbreeding methods. Vegetable oils are so commonly used in food processing and biofuels, even soaps and perfumes, that they uh, the global market for vegetable oil 
is estimated to be worth around 241 billion US dollars uh, a year. And it's expected to only increase. So even a modest increase in yield from oil from plants, yield of oil from plants could be massively economically beneficial as well as potentially more sustainable. So we could produce more oil on the same amount of land or we could reduce the amount of land that we're currently using and keep plant oil production the same. Or the more likely scenario is we would still use more land and get more oil out of it. Uh, but either way, it's a pretty significant advance. Published in the Scientific Journal uh, Science Advances, the team detailed the molecular structure of a key protein and how it binds to plant DNA, which then signals the plant how much oil accumulation it needs in its seeds. The team modified the gene to enhance the protein's affinity for DNA. The modified versions increased DNA binding tenfold, leading to that 15 to 18% more oil content in the seeds of Arabidopsis. My first reaction, though, was that this is Arabidopsis which is a very small plant that's right. very, very popular in labs. It's probably the best studied plant on the planet. Yep. Robidopsis seeds are extremely fine. They're, they, they almost look like dust. So when you plant them, it's, you, it's just, oh, God, you have no idea if, there's, if that was dust or if that was seeds that went to the dirt because they're so super tiny. So, yay, increase the oil content of an incredibly small seed that probably didn't have a whole lot of oil content to begin. But they show that the protein target, the DNA strands to which it binds, are extensively conserved throughout uh -huh. plants. Which means this could be a common, not only common binding mechanism across many plant species, but this could also trigger the same effect. Currently, vegetable oil provides approximately... A fourth of dietary calories in developed countries. So we were talking before about science feeding the world and how if it wasn't for science and agriculture working together, we wouldn't have as many humans on the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, if this does translate to increases, it's yet another way science will have helped feed more humans than ever have lived at one time upon the earth. Uh, I think we will hopefully increasingly need and it's something that we will hopefully be able to do with increasing sustainability going right forward yeah and if yeah if we can use the same amount of farmland to be able to uh raise the plants that will be able to sustain nutritionally yeah. increasing numbers of people or, or less because we need to make or less farmland forests Right. We need yes, to make more room for all the forests that we're going to use to offset the carbon, which is all of what, was it, what was it last week? Half of the world's current <laughs> crop land needs to, yeah. needs to be turned into forest. So yeah, we really gotta we gotta really make sure we're getting the most out of those uh, those sunflower plants. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, my last story for this first part of the show is making the most of the ice on the planet, uh, the ice cube array experiment in Antarctica, where they have a square kilometer of neutrino detectors detecting neutrinos. We've talked about them on occasion for the past several years. Well, a couple of years ago, they were like, we have detected neutrinos and we have like two and a half sigma reliability our significance is enough to suggest that maybe just maybe messier 77 a spiral galaxy similar to our own milky way galaxy that has a black hole it's a pretty big supermassive black hole at the center at its center it's also known as blair you're gonna love this one the squid galaxy Ooh. How come? Yes, <laughs> because uh, I guess it looks kind of like a squid. I, oh, show me that squid. I don't. I don't know why they call it. If somebody knows why they call it the Squid Galaxy, that oh, would really? be fantastic. I don't actually know why they call it. It looks like a spiral galaxy, so I'm guessing it has something to do with the arms of the galaxy. 
However, uh, it is very far away. It's part of the set of uh, star, what were thought to be star clusters and galaxies that uh, were named many decades ago. Um, and initially, the ice cube experiment was like, hey, look, our neutrinos that we're detecting, I think that we can detect them to this the this galaxy cluster, NGC 1068. What, anyway, they thought it was this one galaxy cluster and they're like, yeah, maybe it's the messier galaxy right nearby it in there. And then they're like, I don't know. We only have two and a half sigma. And then now they're like, we have 79 neutrinos. And because of our 79 only 79, only 79 neutrino observations uh, that were, they were able to pinpoint as coming from this area of space. They've been able to get almost to a five sigma, still under five, but almost to a five sigma significance that it is coming from this area of space. That means that it, these neutrinos could be coming from somewhere behind the Messier system, but at this point in time, uh, it's most likely that they are coming uh, from around there. This is one in 100,000 observation significance. And the uh, the interesting thing about, about this, you know, this story and why neutrinos are, uh, are fascinating is that neutrinos are these very energetic particles that don't really interact with anything. We didn't used to think they had any mass. Now we know they have a little tiny bit of mass, but they're still very weakly interacting with stuff. And so they can go all through space, high energy cosmic particles, bloops. And they, you know, there's a neutrino probably going through you right now, not interacting ah. with you at all. Ah. <laughs> and so uh, when we do actually detect them with our detectors, which have to be in the ground and hidden away and we have to do lots of work to try and uh, and shield them because we create neutrinos from our nuclear reactions. The earth itself creates neutrinos. The sun creates neutrinos. Uh, our, our nuclear reactors on the planet create neutrinos. But the idea of what in the universe could create really, really, really high energy cosmic particles what could be doing it? The neutrinos, being able to actually pinpoint, detect them, and then pinpoint where they're coming from is really important to us because if a neutrino doesn't really interact with anything as it's making its way through, that means it wasn't bothered by other stuff on its way to us. So it's like a, a, it's like somebody really had a free shot hmm. into, you know, that crumpled up paper into the garbage bin. And so we can potentially... You know, looking at Messier, it starts to get at the idea that maybe these supermassive black holes are the big, powerful accelerators that spin things up in the universe and throw out these highly energetic particles and cosmic rays. Until we so figure that out, it's just a, just a hypothesis. You're like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that's why it's important to dig tubes in Antarctica and create these neutrino detectors. We want to learn more about the universe. Mm -hmm. And a quick Google, is. I was not able to figure out why it's called the Squid Galaxy. So, hey, listeners, please tell me at Blair's Menagerie <laughs> at Twist Science. Please tell us. Why, why, why is that? Messier 77 called the Squid Galaxy? Oh. Probably because it looks like a squid. I have no idea. Does it? <laughs> do we look like squids? We don't know. You got to let us know how we look to you. How do we sound to you? Do we sound like squids? I don't know about that either. But this, 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 this is This Week in Science. We're talking about science and we're bringing it to you every single week. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with your friends today because that would just be fabulous and very helpful. All right, let's come back with just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of COVID news. But it's not really COVID news. It's more COVID Boo. vaccine okay. news. Oh, yay. Yay. Yes. We want people to get the COVID vaccines because that mm -hmm. helps to save lives. It is. It's very important. All right. 
Speaking of saving lives, a new paper out, and it, this isn't new, new, totally new news. It's a new analysis. Researchers have published their uh, their analysis of mat mathematical models incorporating data from 152 countries, suggesting that if the richer countries had been more sharing with their vaccines instead of hoarding vaccines, that mm -hmm. uh, there would have been Went bad. As many as 3.8 million lives saved around the world. We could have helped save lives, but instead we prioritized just our own countries. And, you know, there are lots of considerations, and I do understand that. But uh, there was, there is an organization that has been working to develop equality when it comes to vaccine availability called COVAX. And it's a it's a global vaccine sharing campaign, um, and th they were trying to get us and other rich countries to share. They said they said, "Hey, could increase or decrease COVID deaths in, in low income countries by about forty five percent if we had just tried to go for twenty percent vaccine coverage around the globe by the end of twenty twenty one, instead of hoarding and just saying all oh, for us." But yes. Anyway, I think what's frustrating about that is that we immediately didn't learn our lesson and did that again with monkeypox yeah. and let a bunch of smallpox vaccines go literally to waste and threw it away instead of sending it to the areas where it was spreading. Yep. And, and I think that that's the other part of this is it's not just about saving lives. It's about preventing global spread, too. Yeah. So that's, that's by, it. by mm -hmm. sending it to areas where where it could be needed, you can actually save lives in the country that you're currently in with those vaccines by doing that. It's, it's yeah. You know, thinking ahead. Like thinking thinking ahead. A couple steps forward instead of just. Sharing is caring, everyone. I don't know. I, I mean, I think I learned that in preschool. Um, mm. For those of you who are getting your vaccines and are worried about the possibility of myocarditis or pericarditis, um, researchers have been trying to figure out the uh, risks associated with the mRNA vaccines related to myocarditis and pericarditis. And, and remind me what those are. Was myocarditis and pericarditis? <laughs> It's heart it's, problems. Okay. It's heart, yeah, heart. So it's myocarditis <laughs> is inflammation of the muscle of the heart itself, and pericarditis is the inflammation of the pericardium or the sac that encloses the heart. Uh, both of these can lead to uh, uh, negative outcomes, but more often than not, the inflammation goes away and people recover very, very easily. These are not common incidences, but uh, they do happen. It is, uh, I just want to say, the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis just from getting COVID-19 is about 450 per million. Okay. So 450, per, I just want you to keep that in mind as I report the numbers for Moderna and the Pfizer mRNA vaccines, which they have now discovered that the Moderna vaccine has a higher risk of leading to these inflammation states as opposed to Pfizer. Moderna's rates of myocarditis were about 35.6 per million second doses, 22.9 per million doses for the pericarditis, Pfizer 12.6 for myocarditis, and 9.4 per million for pericarditis. I just want you to remember what the risk just from covid all by itself was. So this does also 450, 450 yeah, per million. That's a lot. Yeah. Okay, got it. Additionally, the data trended stronger for men in younger age groups. So younger age groups being 18 to 39 years of age. So if you are in a particular health state where you might be concerned about oh, okay, I'm going to get vaccinated, but which one is going to be better for me? If you have a concern of myo or pericarditis, Pfizer will probably be better. But overall, for the majority of the population, getting vaccinated is better than getting COVID. 
So just wanted to make sure that was clearly stated out here so that we can all share this information so that when the uh, misinformation <laughs> on social media happens, you can go, no, 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 no. I know. I read this. I heard this. I know. <laughs> and don't forget your flu shot. <laughs> and don't forget your flu <clears throat> shot. Yes. And eventually, you know, it is going to turn into, I think I saw a headline in the Atlantic, you know, eventually we're, we, we are all going to not really worry about how many COVID shots we've had because mm -hmm. they're going to be annual and you're going to get your COVID shot and your flu shot. And that's just going to be the way it is. And we're getting there. Mix but it just, up. In big bet. <laughs> wash your hands, wear your masks, be as safe as you can in public mm -hmm. indoor spaces moving forward because woo. The trifecta of diseases. Mm -hmm. You're going to, everybody with kids, they're bringing it home. We're just, we're all sick one week after another. Oh, seriously. Get some sleep, take some Vitsy, eat healthy. Man, what I wouldn't give to be single and go into the clubs again. <laughs> you could not pay me to go to a club right now. <laughs> Full of disease. <laughs> Hot, sweaty. <laughs> Also, I go to bed at nine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a daytime clubs for Blair. Well, at least you're getting your sleep. That's what's good for you. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. If you are enjoying the show, remember, this is 900 episodes. Oh, my goodness. We made it this far. Wow. Can we do more? Well, we can't do more without you. We need you. You are the part, the big part of the equation. Twist plus you equals us having good science fun all the time. So if you really enjoy twists, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link because Patreon is how we really support our ourselves through the show. And uh, if you click on that link, you can choose your level of support, $10 and more per month. We will thank you by name at the end of the show. And Dave Gillespie is letting us know right now, Novavax, which is the low cost open source uh, vaccine that is available. It's a standard vaccine and has a very low myocarditis risk. So there's mo more, more, more out there. Lots of options. But right now it's, it's this week in science. So let's do some more science saying it's time for that wonderful part of the show that's full of invertebrates and strange happenings. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. <laughs> Day clerbing with Blair. On Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? <gasps> Do you like bacon? Oh, yes. No. Oh, yes. Well, no. Yes. Next time you're eating bacon, <laughs> think of, take a look at that piece. Think about if that pig ever resolved a social conflict in its life. Because <laughs> chances are it did. Eat bacon. You're eating conflict resolution bacon. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know I had that in me. In a, in a very small study, asterisk, asterisk, of 104 domestic pigs, bystanders would come in to a conflict between two pigs and try to just kind of smooth things over. So normally, in social animals, there's a couple different types of conflict resolution between the two parties involved, the aggressor and the victim. One is reconciliation, where the aggressor actually um, will kind of reapproach the individual that they were mean to, and they'll try to kind of smooth things over. But the other kind actually is when a third party comes in and uh, tries to kind of initiate de-escalation yes exactly de -escalator, right. so so that's known as triadic contacts and so um 
then it, within these pigs, these 104 pigs, they saw all sorts of examples of reconciliation and they measured them against their genetic relationship. And that was by, you know, their, the way that they looked, how big they, they were, how, how old they were. Um, but then they also did some genetic testing on 31 of those pigs to verify their assumptions and they were right. And so they were able to kind of see through from June to November of 2018, they could see aggressive behaviors like head knocking, pushing, biting, lifting of victim pigs. And then they'd watch the behavior for three minutes afterwards to note what kind of happened afterwards. And, um, and the aggressor would sometimes initiate reconciliation. Sometimes also the victim would initiate reconciliation. That could be nose to nose contact, sitting in physical contact with one another, like sitting nearby, kind of just touching like, Hey, we okay. And then (laughs) another one resting their head on the other one. Um, they found that the reconciliations were significantly higher in more distantly related pigs compared to closely related pigs. That might be because they value relationships differently based on what they can provide, whether they are related or not. Um, But what was really interesting about this study was that distantly related pigs were more likely to engage in reconciliation after fighting to ensure they had social support but this was this was really most common when this bystander would come in. So this third pig would show up, would would walk up, go, hey, hey, break it up, break it up. No. <laughs> so they're fighting. This this third pig comes up and engages with either the victim or the aggressor. When they engage with the victim, the number of aggressive behaviors didn't change, but the anxiety-related behaviors of the victim were lowered. So basically they like gave the victim a pep talk and they were like, it's chill, man. Just, just let him do his thing. He's crazy. Just, just let him be crazy. You're all good. Right. And so their anxiety was lowered. They're reassured by this third pig. But if the, if the, if the bystander pig approached the aggressor, the number of aggressive behavior attacks towards the victim was reduced. So in that case, they're going up, they're going, hey, buddy, chill out, man. You don't need to attack him. He wasn't trying to start anything. Just be chill. Just be chill, man. It's all good, right? So so these bystanders have different... So not only do aggressors and victims have different ways of de-escalating when it's just the two of them, Mm -hmm. But the bystander has different tactics depending on if they are trying to initiate this de-escalation with the victim or with the aggressor. So the study wanted to look specifically at kind of the genetic relationships and how they value different relationships and how um, closely related versus not closely related kin could help with social support and all these sorts of things, which I think is very interesting. But (laughs) I think with the social interactions here are actually way more interesting to me. Just the fact that this third pig has any investment or interest in what two pigs are doing. And I think that that is really the meat of this conversation is is that these, these bystander pigs are inserting themselves into aggressive relationship that's there's got to be an inherent risk there so for some reason they're sticking their their snout in where it doesn't necessarily belong to to (laughs) calm down one of these two individuals so how do they pick that individual and that's part of what this study was trying to figure out but i think didn't come up with anything substantial yet just essentially more questions but also yeah why what is their what is their skin in the game that they're that they're they want to reduce these aggressive interactions in their social structure? So I don't have answers. I only have questions at this point. They do have some pig skin in the game, though, for sure. Yes. Um, the, it was only one group of adult domestic pigs, so it's not necessarily representative of pigs in general or mammals in general or social animals mm-hmm. in general or anything like that. But I do think this is a really interesting starting point to, to you know, I was just thinking about like the dog park. 
like there sometimes dogs will two dogs will kind of start getting yeah. into it a little bit. Sometimes other dogs will come in and join in on the fight. Sometimes other dogs will come in and, and kind of try to distract one of the dogs. It's very strange. And what is impacting that behavior? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to get yourself in where those sharp teeth are? Which I have been bitten by a pig and their teeth are sharp. So. <laughs> of course you have. That's the thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's, I don't. I think the other interesting aspect of this is that they um, do have impacts that the uh, the input of these pigs coming in from the outside are are helping like they are changing how the uh, the how the social situation mm -hmm. turns out, which I think is fascinating. But right. How the are they related? Though. What is the motivation? Is it like, hey, don't mess with my friend? Is it, yeah. hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to help beat up or <laughs> like whatever it is. <laughs> so I think I, I, I am like the only, I'm trying to picture, there's one very clear memory I have of witnessing conflict resolution of this nature by a third party in the animal kingdom. And this was, I had a mule. I had a mule named Misty when I was seven years old. Cute. And we also had these seven half-broken, nearly wild stallions that were collected from the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, six or seven of them. And, and they would end up at some point at the fence of our, the neighboring ranch, and their horses would be there. And they'd be like, <laughs> braying and displaying and like, all right, kind of like arguing back and forth. And then here would come Misty, who didn't hang out with the horses much, would come in braying, eah, 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 run down the center of the fence line, right? And the, both herds of the, the, the horses would just take off in different directions. And, and I remember thinking that my mule was just really annoyed by them. <laughs> and that's what, that's what got her to do that behavior, was she was just so annoyed with those dumb horses arguing over the fence all day, that she would just break it up. Break it up here, everybody. Yeah, yeah I think Neither. that'd be something really interesting to look at too. To to that point, Justin is that could um, add stress, right? If you're if you're cortisol the levels, right? Yes. Like if you yeah. Like cortisol levels. If you break up these fights, do cortisol levels dip? And if you prevent the pigs Creating. from breaking up fights, does, does cortisol go up as there are more and more fights or the fights are longer or any number of things? So that's There's really interesting. More. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm I not, I, we've all heard how smart pigs are, uh, that some people have pigs as pets and yes. pigs are, you know, their intelligence is well known and they do live in groups. Domestic, domestic pigs have to live in very, very, very large social groups very often. So the idea that they may have developed at some point in evolutionary history, um, you know, even before we threw them into very, very large mega farms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is yes. only 104. Yeah. This is not quite mega, but, well, mega, but, yeah. <laughs> but definitely there are other ones. And then, yeah, is the same happening with cows with bees with dogs with like with monkeys like what are what's happening with conflict see, that's, resolution that, that's the thing it's like with cows i go mm, i don't know i don't look at the intelligence of cows as highly as the intelligence of pigs right but i've only so, recently started to really look at the intelligence of bees as being so incredible so there's potentially a lot of misunderstanding on humanity's mm -hmm. part. And uh, mm -hmm. cows just, are extremely social. Like they, they you are don't very... you don't think about it when you see them in the, hanging out in the pasture, just standing around there looking bored. But yeah. they're they're hanging out with cliques. Other they have yes. very strong yeah. social groups that they, they interact with. Except yeah. for However Ferdinand. He had his flowers. Aww. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. What else you got, Blair? Ferdinand. Uh, I have fish with low self-esteem. Um, so Northwestern University led an international collaboration looking at zebrafish's fish's brains and eyes and where fish look when they swim. 
Where do you think fish look when they're swimming? I would have thought. Think about oh. a fish eyeball. Right. On, well, out to the sides. Oh, yeah. Off to yeah. The sides. Up, up, out to the sides. Uh, uh, predators that are going to be, where are the predators yeah. coming from? That's what I want to know. Great question. Well, it turns out this study tells us that that fish spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time looking at the ground, <laughs> down at the bottom of yeah, the You don't river. want to trip. Yeah. Oh. It, it, kind of, yes. So this is, so let me tell you how they did the study first. And I'm going to tell you what they think is actually happening here. So they took zebra fish and they, they created a model with a few different methods here. So they visited seven sites across India to gather video data of shallow rivers where the zebra fish are naturally. They encased a 360 degree camera inside waterproof diving case, attached it to a remotely controlled robotic arm. They dunked the camera, right? Then they used the robotic arm to move it around under the water. They were able to model hypothetical scenarios where a simulated fish moved arbitrarily through a realistic environment. Great. So then in the lab, they had zebra fish where they tracked the zebrafish's motions inside a ball of LEDs. They were able to change what the zebrafish saw at different spaces in this kind of sphere they were inside so that they could move it across and watch the fish's responses, responses to stimuli in different areas. So they could see where they were focusing the most. When patterns appeared on the bottom, the fish swam along with the moving patterns as opposed to other areas on the sphere. So this is evidence that the fish were looking down at their visual cues. And then, so for example, if you played a video with moving stripes, they'd move along with the stripes. It's, uh, and they, they'd kind of swim faster and faster, wagging their tails faster and faster more to try to keep up with the moving stripes. They then abstracted the data from the videos, combined it with the data from the, uh, the lab experiments. And they combined that with data from how motion signals get encoded in fish brains. They fed the data sets into two pre-existing al algorithms used for studying optic flow, which is the movement of the world across the eyes or camera lenses. And they found that in both scenarios in the wild and in the lab, zebrafish were looking down when swimming forward. They... The reason they think that they're doing this, because it doesn't make sense. Camouflage. You want to look up for predators. You want to look around. Are you looking down for camouflage? So what they actually think is happening is the same thing that happens when, or has this ever happened to you where you are in a parking spot and there's a car on either side of you? And you're like kind of not paying attention. You're sitting there. You haven't put your car into reverse yet, but the car next to you starts backing out and you go, ah! you think you're moving forward. They yeah. think that's yes. exactly yeah. what this is about, is that mm. there's there's all the stuff moving in the riverbed. There's pebbles, there's other fish, there's particulate in the water, there's light dancing in the water, there's movement of, of gravel and Ooh, all yeah. the other Very stuff going on around them. Yes, and so they think that this is essentially that they are, are trying to keep reference in a space so that they they don't get swept away with the water and so that huh. they they know where they are in relation to the environment the, they're saying the visual cue from the other stuff around them is so strong that it could override all the other senses telling them that they're not moving that's what's happening to us when we're in our car and that other car starts to back up we know we're not moving we can feel through our vestibular system that we're not moving but our brain tricks us into thinking that we might be moving in that moment and so um this misleading motion could come from cues above them to the side of them. And so the most reliable signals are at the bottom of the river. And so now we're going to be using these zebrafish as a model for car sickness. Interesting. So actually, yeah, actually <laughs> Interesting. Somebody... Uh, what, what they're actually going to do is, you can guess, use them make as robots. a model for, of course, robots. Robots. So they want to yeah. make a fish-inspired robot. Um, and if they were just looking at the anatomy, they would have eyes pointing sideways. So based on this study, they know actually to have the majority of the eye time spent looking downward so that they can balance all the other tasks with stabilizing in a liquid environment. 
So fascinating idea, the stabilization in a liquid environment. I mean, our atmosphere is a fluid, so we're in a fluid, but we're tacked to the ground because of our legs and gravity and the way that we move through space and time. The fish are completely different, and I have never considered this aspect of their their physiology, their their biology, this evolutionary force on the way that they interact. I mean, it's very similar to, I would imagine, birds. So I wonder if there is some similarity in some of their sensory systems oh, to interesting. Yeah. flying animals. So if, you know, it's hmm. a, just a thicker fluid environment. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. It's but fascinating. I mean and I think that this is a, a good reminder of what you see is not really what's happening. Like if you look at a at a fish eye, it looks like they're perpetually looking sideways, ways, like we were saying, but their eyes don't work that way. They can actually adjust mm -hmm. focus to different directions, even though their eye is immovable. So hmm. it's it's one of those things where we we understand our eye or our our eye works. We see their eyes. We kind of project that same functionality onto their eyes, but that's not how their eyes work. How can we use this? I'm serious. How can we use this to fight uh, car sickness, motion sickness, um, and be better space travelers? Yeah. That's what, that's what we need to know. That would be great, especially if we got to hightail it to Mars later. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I anyway. actually had the experience of something like this uh, this morning. Oh yeah, uh, just, I didn't, just moments I, ago, going to Mars. <laughs> yeah, no. like no, a couple, a couple hours ago, <laughs> looking out the window, saw a formation of lights in the sky, racing at a at a very quick pace, all in uniform. I was like, oh, what is that? And then I realized uh, that they it was a cloud that was illuminated by the moon, which is almost mm. a full moon, if not a full moon, that was moving towards a bunch of stars. But because it, it like for some reason had triggered as the fixed object, as the ground yeah. in my mind for that moment, you know, I, I got as far as my in, internal dialogue the going, what the, oh, I see what's happening. <laughs> but it, it had this really weird feel, uh, look or feel that all these stars were, all these lights that were stars were racing towards something. But they were, of course, motionless and the cloud was, yeah. the illuminated cloud was moving towards them. Uh, but yeah, I, I did. You know, when I first saw the the images you were showing, it looked like to me it looked like they were trying to track the shadow. So it looked like an effort to stay camouflaged by having the mm. the darker ground below them because that would better match them, and then so they'd be hidden from being eaten above. Right. Uh, but I now, nah, but yeah, if you really put yourself in the mind of a fish there's a lot mm -hmm. going on that could be distracting yep yeah. put yeah. yourself in the mind of a fish yeah Do you have yeah and then oh, yeah and yeah real that? quick i was going to talk about these octopuses that okay talk about yeah, the octopuses um, that uh this is late breaking news i have not reviewed the story so here we go <laughs> But uh, this is all about octopuses throwing objects at each other. So including, I think, sometimes fish. So there is that. Um, but octopuses are generally very, uh, the majority of them are solitary. They're, we know about some that kind of hang out in groups. But generally speaking, they are solitary. And in um, a 2015 study, there was more than 21 hours of video recorded um, off the coast of New South Wales where they captured the behavior of about 10 octopuses throwing, propelling, projecting objects that had been gathered. Um, and so they, <laughs> they, they kind of wanted to look into this uh, octopus throwing behavior. <laughs> Both males and females did it. The majority of them were females. Two individuals accounted for 66% of throwing. So also, you know, I'll recognize this is kind of a smaller sample size so this could just be a isolated incident i don't think it is but it could be out of 102 throws 32 percent were related to octopuses cleaning out their dens they're just saying i don't want this stuff in here Ugh. <laughs> eight percent occurred after uh, eating probably i'm done like kind of thor like Psh, another and then um the major the majority of what was thrown was shells 53% of recorded throws occurred within two minutes of one octopus interacting with another that could be fighting, mating or grappling. And so that does seem like they were throwing stuff at each other. 
<laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Don't let the door hit you on the way out or the shell. No. Um, 33% <laughs> of these throws involved material hitting another octopus. So, um, 20% of the time their aim was not good is what it sounds like to me. Uh, but it's hard to throw things underwater. It seems to researchers like it is deliberate. Some of the evidence for that includes that they found octopuses using an unusual combination of legs to hold the material and throw it. So mm. this doesn't seem like another behavior that just kind of ended up in a, in a lob. Um, and that they were turning darker right before they did it, which usually means that they're feeling aggressive. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's very strange. They're not sure why they're doing it. <laughs> and, um, many reasons. No. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be could lots be. of reasons. It, there wasn't really any cases of return fire. So most of the time one octopus would throw something and they, all right, I'm leave it. <laughs> and so uh yeah i don't know i think i think octopuses are just emotive i think this is something that the more we learn about them in captivity too like they they spray people they spray things they they they're cranky they can be cranky <laughs> I, they're so smart i don't know it's just it's one of those things where i feel like sometimes emotional complexity follows intelligence and uh if it is a normal behavior for an animal of any type to throw something when it's mad. I feel like lots of animals do that. They'll like drop things or throw things. It's just like, it's a, it's a natural behavior. If you're holding something and you're mad, you're going to toss it. And so if, if that's all this is, is something kind of got, got their ire up and they had a projectile nearby, why not? Why not throw it? Use what you have in your environment to your advantage, yeah. especially if you're trying to, maintain a territory, uh, if it's mating season, um, like you said, it was more females than males. I imagine females are more likely to, uh, maintain territories because of their, uh, the eggs that they lay. Yeah. I have all the, the sperm packets I create. need. Go mm -hmm. away. Keep your hectocotylus away from me. <laughs> <laughs> they do look really spooky when they turn all dark like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking angry at so got playing on the note to self angry octopus has changed color to be yeah, darker it goes all <laughs> they may throw things at you they yeah yes they may throw things at you or maybe they're just cleaning up and you just happen to be in the way yeah, that's true yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm gonna say that to uh to somebody next time i'm cleaning you're just in my way <laughs> I didn't throw anything at you on purpose, Brian. No. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> Sadie. I'm it. just cleaning. I'm just cleaning. That's <laughs> all. Uh, I'm not cleaning, but this is this is this week in science. Yes, it is this week in science. Justin, what you got? I got an update on Uzi the Iceman. The short Still frozen. Beloved, no, no longer. He's, uh, he's in a museum in Italy somewhere. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, under a, maybe an in, in, in oxidated, uh, non oxygenated uh, uh, little thing. Anyways, oh, been is he very a well studied. Is he leading tours? <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, but he's, he's old, right? This is a 5,300 year old corpse that thawed out of the ice in pretty decent con uh, condition, good enough so that they could do an autopsy and find out how he died. So he thaws out of the ice in 1991, becomes one of the world's favorite archeological finds. Everything about his well-preserved uh, flesh and items are immensely informative. He's got a bunch of tattoos, those are interesting. Uh, the snowshoes he was wearing were constructed with bearskin soles, deer hide on top, a netting mm. made out of tree bark to keep, it from, falling, keep them, uh, from falling through the snow. He had grass wrapped around his feet that functioned like socks for warmth. He had an axe of copper before the Copper Age was thought to have begun. Huh. He, he had a fungus-based fire kit where this fungus would uh, is turned into a powder, and then you'd flint it, and it would ignite. It would ignite quickly. It was a good yeah. fire starter. And you could, once it was lit, smush it down with like a hammer, 
and it would smolder and it would be stay smoldering long enough for you to carry it from one in a pouch from like one campsite to the next. So you didn't even have to reef uh, flint everything. You could just keep that little bit of algae or uh, not algae, a fungus uh, uh, smoldering and could restart a new fire. He had an undigested meal in his belly, giving us a glimpse into diet. And of course, the unlucky fate of having been murdered as a stone (laughs) arrowhead was found lodged beneath his shoulder blade. Yet, such a lucky chain of events had to happen for him to be preserved in the first place. So first, the body had to uh, be freeze-dried in the cool of fall or winter on this mountain in the Alps, then encased in ice uh, beneath a glacier while being protected from the glacier's movements by having fallen into a gully where he remained frozen and only was it was undisturbed for thousands of years, only coming to light because of global warming, climate change melting the, the glacial ice in which he had been frozen. Such a sequence of events means that, of course, Utsi is a sort of archaeological unicorn, one that is unlikely to be repeated. Except... A small <laughs> team of researchers affiliated with institutions in Norway, Sweden, and Austria have found evidence that suggests... There's some flaws in the unicorn story about how Uchi remained preserved for so long, and they have uh, published in the journal The Holocene. In fact, the researchers degre- disagree with almost every part of the original story that I have just told you. The cause of death remains the same. Still, still died of that, uh, that arrow wound. But they suggest that Uchi belly demonstrates that he died in spring, not in the fall or winter. Study of the landscape shows that the remains had not been covered by a glacier, which suggests that Utsi likely melted out of the ice many times. There's also <laughs> evidence that Utsi had been immersed in water several times, so that fit. And the researchers also found evidence suggesting Utsi had not died at where he was found in the gully, but instead had been transported down the mountain by natural environmental processes and come to rest in the gully. So researchers conclude that since their evidence showed Zutsi's remains had survived for so long under very common conditions, it is likely that there are others like him in the Alps to be found as conditions in the area continue to grow warmer. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about a little bit ice patch archaeology where we're finding artifacts and things melting out of the ice but there's and there's there's kind of a tight window to discover them. The thinking is right. that the natural degradation will quickly destroy many artifacts if they're not found quickly, as global warming allows uh, this look into the past. But if Lucy's is any indication, you can melt and maybe refreeze a few times before <laughs> you've done too severe a damage. Uh, yeah, also, people it, people don't like eating freezer burned meat. You know, it's been frozen and <laughs> melted and refrozen. It. Yeah, but yeah, being it, that's different entirely. Yeah. And then my last story is going to make sure there's no uh, plant based aliens that are in the ice that are going to melt. And, oh, you no, know, no, too take bad. Take over that's... your entire Arctic outpost. It's, oh, that's yeah, actually too bad. Probably that's already, already happening. Happened, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Blair. Yeah. Shucks. <laughs> my last story of the night the origins of the alphabet we use today. Commonly, is about 3,800 years old. Mm-hmm. It was created by a segment of an ancient Egyptian population that found hieroglyphs too dang complicated and cumbersome to have any meaningful conversations with. So they had built this shorthand version for texting each other on clay tablets and etching their names under the walls of pyramids. The new format caught on really quickly and soon spread across the region, thanks quite a bit to the Phoenicians, who were credited with standardizing the new text symbols. They get to pick the font, I guess. And some say they were also very good grammar coaches as well. They, they helped autocorrect your texting. Now, one of the oldest texts of that format has been discovered, an indigenous Israeli Canaanite inscription dating to about 3,700 years ago, which is a mere hundred years into the creation 
of these ancient uh, fonts, this ancient alphabet. A comb made of ivory from an elephant's tusk, likely owned by a wealthy person as there were no local elephants, so also likely an imported luxury object. This was discovered by a team from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Southern Adventist University of the United States is published in Jerusalem Journal of Archaeology. The comb bears an inscription. There are 17 Canaanite letters, archaic in form, from the very first stages of the invention of the alphabet script. They form seven words in ancient Canaanite. The first sentence ever found in the Canaanite language in Israel. What message of wisdom, what words from the ancient past were immortalized here for future generations to discover? It reads like an enchantment or perhaps an advertisement, almost an instruction. It reads, May this tusk root out the lice of the hair and the beard. May it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, that could be an enchantment, empowering the comb to remove lice, or maybe it's an advertisement, like telling people, hey, this is what this is for. And then by that sort of an instruction, telling you how to use it. It's also kind of fun is one side of the comb had six thick teeth for untangling knots and hair, while the other side had 14 very fine teeth that was used to remove lice and their eggs, which uh, if, if this is, you've had been unfortunately uh, had to deal with this. This is exactly how they make the current day two sided lice combs that you can go buy in the store. Today. Haven't changed. Yeah. Haven't changed. <laughs> uh, lice combs haven't changed in 3,700 years, folks. Just come out the nits, everyone. They found the remains, the outer, uh, what is it, chitin membrane of the nymph stage head louse was found uh, on, on this comb. But it also shows that regardless of your prominence in society, regardless of your wealth, you could afford this language-inscribed, ivory-imported luxury lice removal comb. You, you still need a lice removal comb, even if you're like the richest. That's uh, that's what around. they that's what they always tell the kids when there's the lice outbreak in school. Is no, no, no. It, it, getting lice, the, the lice attack clean heads. They like clean hair. The so lice. it's a compliment. I've never, I've never gotten it. The lice like any head they can get themselves onto. And yes, yes. yes, it doesn't matter who you are. No. But if your hair is there, the lice are going to attach. Now, I think it's just amazing that they've been able to figure out the writing on it and that it was so very instructive not just no writing, but a, a shorthand, a, I mean, I don't know. It, yeah, it's like almost like shorthand, right? Instead of the hieroglyphs. It's like, so, going, yeah. it's like going the opposite direction from where we are now with emojis. It kind of is, right? Uh, <laughs> right? So, so what, the way you could sort of picture this first language, because all of the symbols of the, the first alphabet largely are just derived from hieroglyphs. So, so much so that, yeah, it is a language of emojis. Right. Uh, where if you put <laughs> certain emojis together, it means this. If you put this other grouping of emojis together, it means that. And so, you know, our transition into, back into emojis, it's the sort of basis Full of language circle. we've been using for s such a long time. Doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, lice, was, wanna... lice have been with us the whole time. If you want, yeah, go look up the ancient Canaanite and uh, actually really look up the ancient Phoenician uh, alphabet. And you'll see how it leads into the Greek and the Roman. And you'll also see how it connects to the, the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Because all of the symbols, all those letters that we take for granted as just being a symbol that stands for something that can make a sound. They all started out as images. Uh, as emojis themselves like that what was it the the letter j uh, was an outstretched arm hmm. it was it used to be on its side like they 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 moved a lot of uh, these things around the w 
was a, a palm hand, which might have turned into the E. Like some of them got it, got changed in use over time. The letter A was a, a, a head of an ox. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Which, which, again, that one, I think, got turned upside down at some point. If you flip the, if the history you flip the of it a, is fascinating. Capital A upside down, yeah. you can see it's very, very, oh, okay, now I can see how this is, still looks exactly like an ox's head. Like if you were going to like make a, a crude symbol of an ox's head, it's perfect. Okay, With the horns, down. a capital A. Yeah. The low, a lowercase a, not. Still, it still has kept its, its ancient form. Yeah. Old combs, new technologies. Lice is still here. Now, I don't need to talk about going to the club. Day clubin. We're going day clubin. But you know, if you're not going clubin, you should be getting some sleep. That, that is, I mean, there's so many studies. Just go to sleep, everybody. Published in a journal that is appropriately called Sleep. Researchers have published their study, Sleep Restriction Reduces Positive Social Emotions and Desire to Connect with Others. So in their study of 50-ish healthy emerging adults, now I love the, the, the idea of an emerging adult as if it's emerging from the, like there's a child. Primordial teenness. I, there was a chrysalis at some point. I mean, I don't think so. But anyway, just some cocoon. <laughs> these these kids, aged eighteen to twenty eight years old, uh, were randomly assigned to one night of sleep restriction with only four hours in bed, or allowing eight hours of sleep, regular typical sleep, and then. They asked the participants to report on their desire to pursue social connections. And then they had to complete a task in which they had to reflect on their gratitude for something that someone had done for them recently. And they found that the people who, uh, who reported their desire to pursue these, these reflections, like their uh, self-reported motivation was low. They're like, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to go talk to anybody because I'm tired. Right. They're like, I don't, I don't need to talk. I don't want to talk to you. Totally and agree. then the, in the reflection, the researchers looked at the words that were used and coded the different words, looking for words and how they were focused, whether they're self-focused or whether the words were focused on other people. And they found that there were fewer socially oriented words used by the individuals who had slept le slept less. Mm -hmm. So people were much less likely to reflect on their gratitude in a way that was actually <laughs> reflective of gratitude <laughs> to others. Um, but in this whole situation, it, uh, it, it just goes to show once again that if you are feeling like you're unusually unsociable, that you don't want to hang out with people, that you're, you know, something is abnormal in the way that you want to interact with others, that perhaps getting some sleep will help with that. I know, H-N-E-K, I never get enough sleep. What am I supposed to do? Right. And so then this is, this becomes the, the question of, you know, there's too much sleep leading to demotivation, not enough sleep leading to demotivation and so there's that happy middle right mm -hmm. moderation which unfortunately is very hard to come by these days yeah. sleep as you can if i mean sleep them if you've got them i don't know if that works anymore hmm. um <laughs> it's good for you and um i think we've done all of our stories have we made it to the end of the show Oh, I think we, we have. I think it's time for a nap. I think we have. might be time for a nap. Nine hundred no episodes. I think we deserve a nap. We did nine hundred mm. episodes tonight. Mm. That's mm. very long. Once again, cheers to all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your curiosity. 
Thank you for your friendship. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you for listening, everyone. So I think it is time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. Is it time? It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time for me to say thank you. I just said thank you, but I'm going to say thank you again. Fada, thank you. You've been with us for so many episodes, helping and doing social media and show descriptions since what, 2015, somewhere around there. Is that, wow. It's been so long. Thank you so much for all of your help. Uh, Identity 4, thank you for recording the show. You've been recording the show for quite a while. If you've been saving all these episodes, your drives are definitely full. Oh, gosh. Get a dust broom in there. Mm. <laughs> I also have to say thank you to Gord, Aranlor, uh, Goldizator, others who are in the chat room constantly and are helping to keep the chat rooms very nice happy places to be. Thank you for all your time in the chat rooms and moderating in there and our patrons. And thank you to our discord server, everyone noodles. Who else is in there? Kevin unique. I know uh, Kevin, you're in other places. Schnago. Who else is in there? We've got hot rod and there's a bunch of other people over in the over. Uh, oh, Identity 4 says he has a 16 terabyte NAS drive. So he's got plenty of room to record more twist episodes. Gaurav Sharma, HNEK, all of you who are here tonight in our YouTube chat room, our Twitch chat room, our Facebook chat room. Thank you for being here and for chatting and being a part of the conversation. So it's just wonderful to have your engagement and your presence. And of course, I do have to say thank you to Rachel for bearing with us. And yes, you're going to have to... Um, cut out a few bits tonight from the edit and uh, additionally of course to our patreon sponsors for those of you who support the show financially we really can't do this without you 900 episodes is a huge deal and you've made such a huge difference Teresa smith james schaefer richard badge kent northcote rick rick loveman pierre velazar ralphie figueroa john ratnaswamy carl kornfeld karen tazi woody ms chris wozniak dave bunn vagard chefstad hal snyder Jonathan Stice, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gorov Sharma, Regan, Derek Schmidt, Don Munda, Stephen Albaran, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Matt Bass, Boat Beto for Texas. I wonder Ooh, if it's going to change. I think it needs to month. change. Yeah. John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Kessenflow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick, Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthan, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your support. And, and, and you, keep it keep it going. We're less than two years away from episode 1000. Yeah, so I we're going to need some Patreon support so that we can have a, a, a crazy event. <laughs> I think if we, if we do episode, if we get to episode 1000, there needs to be something big. There will be, there needs to be, there needs to be live in person. There needs to, it needs to be a destination. We're going to have multiple speakers. It'll have to be oh, a festival -y kind cool. of thing. It'll I think it'll have day. to be, it'll have yeah. to be a whole day. Yes. It'll have to be big. Like so it. yeah. Do you like the idea of that? Yeah. It's less That's, than two years away. It's, it's close. We got to start, start planning now. It. We have to start planning it now. That's right. Garav, someone do a rough calculation. Let's figure out when well, it's going to be. Two years and four weeks. -ish. <laughs> and so October, yeah. That's wrong. That's October less than two years. 10th. Two years minus four weeks. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So October 10th. -ish. October. Yeah, October-ish in two years. Okay. Plus or minus, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll just, you know, it'll be your uh, wedding anniversary getaway weekend, Blair. <clears throat> Multitasking. It's what we do now. Yeah. But if anyone is interested in the meantime in uh, helping us out on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. Uh, tomorrow, I am inter interviewing Professor Matthew Cobb about his book, As Gods. And it's about genetic engineering and the uh, ethical choices that we're making. And it is at 11 a.m. Pacific time 
tomorrow. Thursday, November 10th, 2022. But next Wednesday, we'll be back. Yeah, next Wednesday. Wednesday, well, actually, we're going to have two broadcasts next week. We have one Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And we have a second <laughs> broadcast that will also be live uh, Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time. He means it's but the exact the same, same time. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one broadcast. <laughs> broadcasting live, of course, from our YouTube, mm -hmm. Facebook channels, from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe you can uh, put on some low bass in the background while you all listen and dance to all, all doof, doof, the science doof. anyway just search for this week in science where podcasts are found <laughs> if you enjoyed the show get your friends to subscribe as well take their phones sign up for them for Happy more surprise. information on anything you've heard here today show notes links to stories will be available on our website www.twist.org and you can also sign up for a newsletter you can also contact us directly email Kiki at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistmanina at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, and also explain why it's called the Squid Galaxy, or I'm going to delete your email immediately. Oh! No, no, I won't. <laughs> Ouch. You can also yes. hit us up on the Twitter for now, where we are at yes. Science at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love Love, Love your, your feedback. feedback if there is to yeah. cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night. Please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. <gasps> it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand just to understand Your philosophy I broke it. <laughs> it's the after show, everyone. We made it. Yay. <gasps> Woohoo. Yeah, yeah, Blair, I love the vest and the top hat. It's wonderful. I brought my tiara for the occasion. You've done it. My crooked tiara. That's all I ever get is crookedness. In style. You said you would have the top hat, and you did. You brought it. I did it. I, I appreciate it. It took a it. second. And I found it. And I love the spider. The Lego spider is wonderful. That's fantastic. And Blair had shared. Let me uh, get cover. the cover. We have a uh, cover image. Do, 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 do. Where did all my emails go? Do, 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 do. Uh... Cover! Woohoo! There it is. Okay. I will open that up and you can see the wonderful cover for the 2023 calendar that Blair has put together her Lego calendar cover. 
Ah, thanks, Garav. Yes, twist 2023. The calendar is coming. And I know Blair wanted to get things up for sale tonight for episode 900. And I was working on it, but eventually it's, you know what? We're doing our best. Yes. We we're are all doing, just our, doing best. our best. We're, do, we're doing our best here. Um, but what I am going to say is that um, we will either do our usual thing through Mixbook, do the order, and then do the order fulfillment ourselves because that's like an easy way to do that. But we'll do the order fulfillment to, um, Places where we can, uh, where the shipping makes sense. So we may only do domestic shipping this year, which I feel very bad about. Um, but I also, I mean, it's very expensive for people to order a calendar and uh, internationally. Um, but we will do digital downloads because we can do a PDF and we will offer digital downloads for half the price of the calendar and it will not have any shipping. So... Um, if people want to download the calendar and uh, print it themselves on whatever, whatever kind of paper they want, then that is also a possibility. And um, so that uh, we that won't have holidays on it, though, right? It won't have our science holidays. Okay. No. Did you get my email? In the I saw. The I haven't. I haven't been able to open it yet. So there are a couple. Of, so in Canva, I think you can go okay. through and make the calendar and add text and do all that kind of stuff so that we can do okay. that. Um, okay. I was also looking at Vistaprint as an option. Um, and Vistaprint. Yeah, really looking at that originally. Yeah, if we could download the, I don't know if we can download the PDF that, of the design. I would hope so from Vistaprint. But if we can do that, then they can do fulfillment of a certain number so they have a system where you can do where they do the fulfillment and and the printing and um, everything. And they have a pretty good system for creating the calendars as well. So huh. interesting. we have some options. I just really I want to make sure that everybody I want to make sure that international listeners and yeah. viewers are able to get a calendar. Somehow, yeah, I is, feel like, yeah. But, yeah, I just can't figure out how to, I'll, I'll play around with it. I Are can't you on figure Canva out how right to, now? Yeah, I can't figure out how to change date, like add text to dates, but I'll figure it oh, out. Oh, I think we would just hit the text button and then I you see. just add it on top. Okay, that, we would just that will take in. a very long time. <laughs> But if we, I mean, I'm happy to help too, you know, okay. so if, if you want to, I mean, we can, we can split it up and yes. make sure that it gets done sooner rather than later. Yes. And I'm happy to. Yes. Now I have a whole, literally it, my entire have... day on Saturday is twist calendar. So. Awesome. Yeah. So if we've got the spreadsheet of the dates and yeah. have that all uh, double checked, then we, I mean, ha I'm happy to help do that and we can make the. Uh, and then we've got a PDF and Canva also allows allows downloads and printings, but I've never ordered one from Canva before. So I don't know how that works. And I don't know how we would do that as a marketplace. So, right. yeah. Interesting. Um, so everyone who's here right now and listening, just, you know, just understand that I we do a podcast and we... Yeah. Doing a calendar is super fun, and I'm so happy that Blair does it every year. Yeah. But there are certain details that just are, I mean, I'm into science, but business and marketing and products and stuff are, that, there's just, that's complexity that I, I details I find, yeah. <laughs> find complicated. Yeah. Oh, I've got I've got a ton of of great ideas. Uh, they just uh, require a research team and a big bag of money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Somebody else just make that happen. Yes. Well, and There's also we've been be making done. these Do since it. 2016, and uh, I guess mm -hmm. 2015 because we did the 2016 yeah. calendar. And um, resources have changed. Like exactly. Canva didn't exist yeah. then. I don't yeah. Think. Yeah. So yes. So, and we haven't changed the, the way that we've uh, produced it since then. Yeah. So I think it's, I think 
modernizing it and making it available in different ways, it's about time that we do that. I looked into Zazzle and we can make the calendar in Zazzle. However, it will okay. not have the the holidays. Right. Like right. we can have it just put like, you know, U.S. holidays yeah. kind of in it, but we can't add our own holidays to it. And yeah. you can't just no do an fun. upload of a calendar. Yeah. This to print well, so is much more what we would want to do. I looked at Printful and print Printify and... There are all these okay. things where it's like, if you have a Shopify shop space and then you use Printful is the thing. I'm just like, uh, yeah, it's a whole new system to implement. So and then, I'm like all of a sudden, yeah. Maybe, maybe what makes the oh. most sense then mm -hmm. is Zazzle for printed and shipped calendars. And then we make digital calendars with Canva. And, and we can make that available, you know, through our website pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. Because you purchase and it can... and then you get a, and then you get a download yeah. link. <clears throat> yeah. And then I guess there could be a third option where people pay slightly more and we'll order a small batch of printed calendars through Canva and then you can still mail them domestic. Yeah. Yeah, can't through Canva or Mixbook, either one. Yeah. But yeah. 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 I, it's um I feel like I'll look at it, but I think if we, I I'd rather not put manually put in all the dates twice. I agree. So yeah. uh if we're gonna do a digital calendar through Canva, I can just do that and then we can we can okay. teach Mixbook. Though they, we'll have take been, that. they have been good to us at this point, but we have to look at how much it's going to cost if it's going to be similar to order through Canva. Yeah. I mean, the big one is your art and how special that is. Although the science holidays are so fun to have on a calendar. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very much know. so. Maybe we'll have a lot more orders if people are getting the... I don't know. I, li I like physical Individual. calendars, yeah. wall calendars. I don't know. I don't know. We could also, um, we could uh, create a Blair's Animal Corner 2023 planner and have it uh, printed through Amazon's print on demand. Oh. Because they print books. Interesting. Ah, uh, Rick wow. Loveman, thank you for that input about Vistaprint. That's fascinating. Oh. So a planner through Amazon. I, that's, hmm. I think Vistaprint is the one that uh, it says the negotiators are inconsistent. If you call twice, you get different prices. And the paper, paper stock price lot. Vistaprint. In the Bay Area. Uh, I'll just, this is, uh, this is an unsolicited uh, ding on oh. the company. Signed me up for some five dollar a month auto pay thing that I never signed up for, and discovered a, like a year in. I was like looking over banks. I was like, "What's this? Why is Vistaprint still charging me for something that I did like a year ago?" And I looked in. It was like every month, and I just hadn't seen it. Ugh. And those I, kinds of things you got to watch out for. Uh, well, but I do, I and I tell you. I never clicked on, subscribed on, or agreed to anything, and they still signed me up. So yeah, I don't really like Vistaprint. I have ordered from Vince Vistaprint before and enjoyed it. Their products. So I got the products I got from them. It was great. Yeah, the the different five dollar a month charge they signed me up for, which was for some weird no. like uh, some very like nonsensical thing. <laughs> Like, it was some sort of like, yeah, this will allow you to have access to support for our team. I don't even remember what it was, but it was like utterly dumb. Oh, uh, Noodles, have your last birthday cupcake. We I started this calendar conversation because you made your comment in the Discord. Happy birthday, Noodles. Oh, happy birthday. Ooh, Enjoy that birthday cupcake. Yeah. And you can, you can gift yourself. It's just not going to be tonight. We will be getting these out. I wanted to do pre-orders, but I think with uh, if we're going to do digital downloads, it'll be easier just to have have it order. You can order a digital download, and then we'll make uh, we will do pre-orders for the 
physical ones that people want to get from us mm -hmm. that'll have all the science holidays and everything on them. Um, we'll figure it out, everyone. We'll figure it out. Maybe we will make uh, a little special Patreon thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Gorov, yes, Zazzle has great quality on stuff. The tote bag and doormat you get. I love my I love my towel, my twist towel. I have to say I ordered myself a big beach towel and it makes me very happy. Mm. I really enjoy it. Kind of sad we're in the we're we're, we're digging into winter right now and uh, the cold weather is here. I'm going to have to pretend that I'm at the beach one day with my twist towel. I live in Australia. No, I don't. It's 30 degrees outside. Happy 900 episodes. Woohoo. Woo we did done, done it. it. Yeah. We did we did done it good. We're keeping it up there everybody and um you know Justin, I don't know what happened with your internet earlier. At the beginning of yeah, the show. Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, it's, it's fine now. Fine. And this happened two weeks ago, too, yeah. where it yeah. started horrible and then kicked in. I I don't know if there's some sort of throttling going on. I don't know if there's some sort of, like, reason that people are all jumping on the internet. At 5.30 in the, the morning. They just got home the from the club. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> It's the Wednesday night clubbers. I don't yeah. understand why <laughs> it's a thing that is happening yeah. with now some frequency, but hopefully, hopefully, eh, hopefully it doesn't happen again. I don't know what else to... Blair, I'm still freaking laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to oblige. I'm just putting it together with the doomf, doomf, the club. Anyway, okay. Say good night, Blair. <laughs> good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good, good night. Night and Kiki. happy 900th episode, Kiki. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Thank you for wearing your top hat. My pleasure. Ooh. Two years, everybody. Let's make it a thousand. All right. Thank less you for joining years, us. In less than two years, we'll be at a thousand episodes unless we take a week off. We will. We will. I like weeks off. It's good about for two the, years. Good for the soul. The science never stops. We never stop. We don't. But uh, tomorrow, 11 a.m. Pacific time, if you're around, uh, join me for an interview with a hopefully very interesting. Uh, gentleman, Professor Matthew Cobb, who has also been on uh, what are these? What are the fancy, the fancy British podcasts? Welcome to the Monkey House, or somebody and somebody and somebody. There's like some British podcasts that are. <laughs> wait, wait, you're saying there's other podcasts? Now, is, there are other is, podcasts. Yes. I thought yes. we were the there one are. podcast that was. Uh, yeah. Um, well, anyway, the Infinite Monkey Cage is one that he has been on before. He's written for The Guardian. He's also been written for New Scientist. He's written like six books. This is another book of his, and he's. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time. I hope that you can join us, Justin, if you're uh, around and awake. Feel free to jump in for it's a quick it's half a, hour. It's at 11 a.m. You say? Yes. Okay, that could be that could be doable. That could be doable. Yes, it's a quick it's a quick half hour though. So that's it. We're done. In but a that's half on, hour. On Friday? Well, maybe maybe I'll listen while I'm working. Mm -hmm. Maybe Wait, I'll be you, in the chat room. That, I'll be in the chat. I wasn't paying attention. Is that on? What Friday? is it? If it's a if it's no, it's 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 your today. Tonight. Yeah. I won't be able to make it if it's my today. Yeah. Okay, it's I'll your be, today. I'll be tonight. In, uh, it's your tonight. Danish language school. Ooh, how is that working? Very fine. I can eat that a dance. You can. You can dance. Can I tell it? I that I can eat that a dance. He dances dance in the club. <laughs> he dances in the, in the club. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. 
Jeg er dansk. He dances on the club on television, is what he's saying. I can tell you, I haven't been to. I haven't been to the club in uh, in Copenhagen. Any of the clubs in Copenhagen? But I a hundred percent guarantee you, they don't call them the club. Take the your baby to the club. It'll be great. Clerb. We're going to the club. All right. Beyond 11 a.m. tomorrow, we will be back uh, next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And Justin, make sure you reboot that uh, router before you come join us next week. We will see y'all in the science club. Doof, doof, doof. I bet, I bet, I bet. Oh, my God. I got to go. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay curious. Go get your sleep.